Okay. Now I'm recording. Okay. So, um, yes, in this training, we are going to talk about the different human impacts on the environment and also about the, the international agreements and frameworks related to environmental issues. And at the end of the training, we are going to talk about this new right to a healthy and a safe environment. So, okay, let's start. Okay, so uh, as you can see guys, as you also know, um, the current environmental issue, environmental crisis is due to our activity, is due to the human activity and due to our lifestyle. So uh, there are many impacts uh, uh, caused by the human beings, for example, the population growth, the economic growth, the um, develop of, of urbanization, the, uh, the, the technological development and all these um, and all these things have impact impact on the on the environment and uh, and yeah like negative consequence consequences in all ter ter territorial ecosystems. Um, mm, later in the training we are going to talk about more about these specific uh, impacts, okay? So um, as I say, the humanity uh, has altered the planet in many detrimental ways to the point that um, where, where our world uh, is, facing, is facing several interconnected environmental challenges because of the patterns of consumption and production in uh, some areas of the planet. So uh, to continue to perpetuate this uh, production of clothing, uh, food, housing, infrastructures, um, along with uh, a water demand, um, a demand of uh, yeah, a greater demand of water, and also the demand for natural resources, we are in um, we are having like. Um, and sustainable habits that we have to change. So in this regard, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, for um, everyone who doesn't know what is, this is, uh, the IPCC, it is the United Nations body responsible for assessing scientific knowledge uh, related to climate change. So um, this institutions, institution, I have to admit more people, okay. Um, this institution states with 95% certainty that the main cause of human activity, uh, that, that, sorry, with 95% that um, certainty that the main cause uh, is human activity and that the, that the consequences are already evident in the atmospheres, oceans, curiosphere, biosphere, and all our ecosystems. So in this way, human activity generates um, adverse consequences at environmental, at environmental, economic, and social levels in such a way that this destruction and deterioration uh, is having a negative impact on our democratic governance to our, our society and uh, way of life. But uh, guys, also it's important to remember that no people and society uh, societies contribute equally to, to environmental crisis. Um, regarding this, the United Nations states that the richest 1% of world's population emits more greenhouses than the poorest 50% of the people around the world. So, uh, in other words, the contribution to environmental degradation is much higher in industrialized in countries than in the rest of the world. Um, also, the United Nations remind us uh, that we use the equivalent of 1.6 Earths 
to maintain our current uh, our current lifestyle. So we have to change uh, our pattern of consumption and production in, if if we want a sustainable future. Okay, let's talk about the uh, pandemic, about the COVID, because um, the pandemic has had a major impact uh, in the in the environment, and but also taught us some lessons. Um, okay, firstly, the pandemic caused uh, governments to stop prioritizing uh, environmental issues uh, because they decide to prioritize others. But this led to illegal deforestation, poaching, um, um, well, a lot of uh, impacts on the environment, but also the pandemic caused a slowdown that led to a reduction in, in the car traffic, in the air emissions, in the greenhouse gas emissions, um, a recovery of species and ecosystems around the world, and many good things for our planet. So it is so that we can reduce the impact of our way of life on the environment if we all become became aware of this issue. Uh, combating this pandemic also shown us that people um, have become very aware of this issue, which proves that the awareness and communication campaigns are effective in carving uh, a problem that affects us all. So um, despite, um, however, all the, um, well, the, yes, uh, all the all the risk that the climate change um, poses to our planet and to uh, the human beings um, are not being tackled with the urgency that uh, that they deserve. Okay, so here we have uh, the first uh, Kahoot question. And as we did in the first training, you have to enter kahoot did dot it and um, enter uh, the pin that I'm going to show you now. So let me uh, change my screen to the uh, kahoot screen. And also let me know when you are ready. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now you can enter the pin and please let me know when you are all ready, please. If anyone ha has any problem, can uh, tell me. Okay, Sofia, I see you here in the Kahoot. So Tiris, Kat, Andrea, Hermion, okay. Ready, Andrea, okay, thank you. Okay, we are seven. Possible direct link. Uh, no, I don't think so. You have to put this in your mobile phone or in your laptop or, or computer, kahoot.it and then uh, only you have to enter the pin, Francesco. QR code. Ah, yeah, yeah, also.
Okay, so let me know when you are ready, Francesco. Okay, let's wait for a few seconds more. Okay, I see you here, Francesco. Okay, we are nine. There are more people in the uh, Zoom, but let's start. If anyone has any problem, please let me know now. Okay, so we can start, I think. Okay, uh, remember guys that you have to, um, to read the question in my screen and also the answers. And then uh, with your mobile phone, you can answer there or with your laptop. Okay, so uh, let's start. Okay, we have seven answers right. But uh, guys, first of all, uh, I have to remember you that you cannot, uh, um, you do not, you cannot close uh, the um, the Kahoot tab, the yes, the game because we have more questions in the training. So please don't close it. Don't close the Kahoot. Okay, so let's see who is the winner of the first uh, question. Kat is the winner, so congratulations. And uh, we can um, continue with the, uh, with the training. So give me a second, please. Okay. Okay, now you see my screen. Um, okay. So uh, having said all these, now, um, we are going to talk about uh, these specific impacts uh, that the human the human beings provoke uh, to the environment. So, could you think, guys, uh, which are these uh, specific negative impacts? What we do to the environment what the human beings uh, make to the environment. I think I know that it is difficult to participate, guys. Um, okay, so uh, let's continue. I will tell you uh, the specific impacts, <laughs> uh, okay. The first one that we are going to talk about, it is the population growth. And um, do you guys remember when on November uh, 15th, it was news that we reached 8 million people around the world. Air pollution for, for sure. So this is yes, uh, air pollution, it is one of the impacts. Um, thank you. Okay, so uh, this figure, the 8 billion people around the world, it is very relevant because only 72 years ago, there were around 2.6 billion people on earth only 72 years ago. So um, between the, the decade of the 1950s and uh, 2022, the number of people on earth has 
Drew, Drew Blade. Uh, and it is estimated that we could reach uh, 11 billion people by, by the end of the 20th century. And in my humble opinion, I think that this, uh, this figure, this number will be, um, will be higher. Okay, so um, in this regard, the United Nations Environment Program uh, also known as UNEP, uh, states that the world's population is growing by 1% annually, which means that every year there is an average increase of 82 million people around the world. So this results in a huge increase in the need of the food, water, housing, clothing, and all natural resources. So this demand currently nowadays is three times greater. So uh, the production system uh, will increase its capacity and with it also the greenhouse emissions and all these things will have a major impact in all our ecosystems. Okay, so uh, that is why it is important to integrate the population growth into climate education and advocacy because climate change is uh, closely linked, is closely connected with uh, population growth. Um, the UK best based charity Population Matter summarized in, in this way. Okay, someone is saying anything? There is a huge economic crisis that is starting to appear, so the population may not increase that much. Yeah, but Petros, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be, yes. Yeah, it could be. Hmm. But I think that is what is happening in Europe and in this uh, kind of uh, rich city, cities, rich countries, you know, but in other um, areas of the world, uh, I think that this population will will increase in, yeah, will increase. So, um, yeah, as I, uh, as I said, the UK-based charity Population Matter says that every additional person increases carbon emissions, the rich mar much more than the poor, and increases the number of climate change victims, the poor much more than the rich. So related to this, we can stay, state that there is a clear relationship between income and greenhouse gases emissions per capita. So the average emissions of people living in industrialized countries are higher than in the middle and low income countries where the majority of the world's population lives, as I uh, said to, to Petros. Okay, so. For example, in the United States, uh, where lives the 4% the of the world's population, it is there responsible for uh, um, 17, sorry, 17% 17 of global energy consumption. So carbon emission per person in the United States are among the highest in the world. Also, we uh, have to remember that the carbon uh, footprint of the US, Australian uh, and Canadian citizens is almost uh, 200 times greater than uh, than the people living in some of the poorest area in in this uh, sub-Saharan Africa in countries such as uh, Niger, um, Central African Republic, or Chad. Okay, uh, the middle-income countries where the uh, seven five percent of the population lives are in the middle between uh, the countries with the lowest emissions and those with the, with the highest carbon footprints. 
And uh, however, it is estimated that in these middle income countries, the industrialization will rise and with it the uh, living standards. So in the coming years, they will catch up uh, with the emissions of the richest countries. So we can deduce that if we do not change the way economies grow, grow, carbon emissions will continue to rise and with it, the climate change. Okay. Um, we have to remember also that the people living, living in the poorest areas of the world contribu contribute the least to climate change and bear the, the burden of the negative impacts of climate change. Uh, this is because the poverty and the social inequality make many uh, low income populations vulnerable to extreme weather, uh, water scarcity, and all these uh, food production problems associated with uh, a warming climate. So we can say that the links between population growth and climate vul vulnerability are visible, are visible around the world. Uh, in particular, nine of the 10 most climate vulnerable countries are in Sub-Saharan Africa which is expected to double population by 2050, uh, accounting, yeah, by 2050. So along with, uh, ha with this uh, population growth uh, and all these uh, uh, problems, the territories of Somalia, Burundi, and the Democratic Republic of Congo are among those countries facing frequent uh, droughts severe flooding, extreme heat, and also land degradation. So um, also all these uh, things uh, will mean that in the Sub-Saharan Sahel region, between 100 and 200 million people will not have enough, enough to eat in the next 30 of, or 50 years. Okay. Um, in addition to all these things, the temperatures in Sahel uh, are rising 1.5 times uh, faster than the global average. So it is expected that a temperature rise of three or five degrees and as much as eight degrees by uh, two, uh, 2100. So uh, as a result uh, of, of these uh, temperatures, uh, the, it will increase the, the droughts, the fluids, uh, and all these problems related to the food production uh, in our region where the 80% the of the farmland is already degraded, degraded and this population growth is reducing the land available for cultivation. So guys, we can say that this rapid uh, growth population poses challenges for the environment and also uh, to our economy. Okay, so here we can see a video where uh, they explain very well this uh, this relationship, this connection between the population growth and also the climate change. Okay, I think I have to share my sound. Give me a second. Uh, uh, okay, here. Let me show you the world. When I was a student, there was one billion people in the West, the rich part of the world, and there were two billion people, each block one billion, in the developing world, and there was a gap in between. What has happened during my lifetime is that we became four billion more in the world, and the richest became even more rich. Where have these extra ended up? With one billion is actually where the West used to be like successful China, Brazil, Turkey. Huh? They acquired the Volvo company. 
So we know that they are just back of us. And three billions are here. They have a relatively decent life. They have two child families. Children go to school, but they live under modest economic situation. Two billion are almost as poor today. One or two billion, as it was before. The poor are a smaller proportion of the world population, but their numbers is almost the same. Now, if I would place them in a sequence, the very poorest two billion, these billions, imagine the seven billion people in the world from the poorest to the richest. And we have seven million children who die every year. Seven billion people, seven million children die. Six of these die in the poorest two billion. One die here in the middle and here almost no one. Where are then the fossil fuel emission? If this is all the carbon dioxide emission in the world, Almost half of it has been here now the last decade with the richest one billion. There are two units here. There is one unit each here and only one unit for these two. It's very unevenly distributed into this direction. They really emit a, mo a lot of carbon dioxide. And these ones are getting so rich, so they are starting to emit more and more. Huh? So what we see now is that we see an addition here because they copy what the riches do. This is the problem of carbon dioxide. The people here in the middle, they hardly doesn't emit anything at all. They just have a lamp in their house. And the poorest, almost nothing. But the challenge for the world now is get away extreme poverty here and get these people to adapt and use less fossil fuel and use more green energy sources so that everyone can share their energy level in the future, because there will be three billion more. Then population growth will stop. And this one will get richer. They will move up here. Huh? They will come on top. This is how the world will look by the end of this century. And the rich, see here, this is the old Western world. It will just be the foundation of the modern world. And they are very few. They will be less than 10% of the world population. So their fossil fuel consumption, their carbon dioxide emission, has to be on a level that can be shared by 10 times as many people. OK. So um, let's continue. <laughs> um, well, here, um, we can see the population of each country in a map that I'm going to um, share with you. But uh, first, I want to ask you guys, uh, which country do you think it is the most populated country in the world? Um, what do you think, guys? Which country is currently the most population, populated country? China, India, India and China, China, okay, thank you guys, India, okay, you are between China and India, um, okay, I'm going to share uh, the this screen, let me a second. Okay. Okay, so uh, we can see that uh, the most populated country is uh, China, as you said, guys, um, with 1,448 million people. And then we have uh, India with 1,406 uh, million people in this country. So yeah, Joe, you were right, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so, okay, let's continue with my uh, presentation. And later when I share with you my presentation through the Google Classroom, you could see this with more time if you want. Um, okay, so the next impact that we are going to uh, talk about it is the economic growth. 
and that according to the United Nations, the world economy has almost fivefold in the last 50 years. So um, this is a, a good thing for, for us, but also um, the price that, that we pay uh, to enjoy this economic development is uh, quite high because this growth led us to the loss of biodiversity, uh, increased the pollution, uh, more degradation of the air that we breathe, massive deforestation and all these kind of things related to the environment. Um, so as I said before, to, to continue to perpetuate this economic model of production and consumption, uh, we use the natural resources that the earth offer, offers us. But there are many alarms, alarms about the depletion of these natural resources, which after all are a, the pillar of our economy and our lifestyle. In this regard, the European Environment Agency present the brief uh, called growth without economic growth, which is an overview of the various ideas about programs beyond economic growth. Uh, so in this briefing, they explain how economic growth leads to increased pollution, consumption, and uh, resource, uh, resource use, uh, and which has negative impact on nature, climate, and human health. Moreover, uh, recent research suggests that economy uh, growth it is unlikely to be completely detached from its environmental impacts. So to achieve a sustainable future, uh, the policies uh, and all the society um, have to change this uh, pattern of consumption and production so we have to um, yeah, change our lifestyle uh, and not only focus on this uh, technological change and uh, hope that, that, uh, that the, the technology will uh, save us all. No, we, we also need a change of consumption and production. So... For uh, do this, uh, we have to uh, find new lifestyle to consume less, but must to be attractive to the people who are not aware of the environmental problems. Okay, so in this regard, the uh, European Agency also remind us that the global material footprint along with a uh, gross domestic product um, also known as GDP, and the greenhouse gas emissions are strongly related and all have been increased increasingly rapid, rapidly. So while population growth was uh, the main cause of the increase in, in consumption between 1970s and the 2000s decade, the emergence of an affluent middle class and its economic growth has been the main cause of the increase in consumption and production since the beginning of the 20th century. Okay, okay. this agency also reminds us that Europe is one of the world's major contributes to, to the environmental degradation and its environmental footprints exceed the recommended limits. Uh, moreover, it is unlikely to meet the environmental policy targets for um, 2030. Therefore, without natural resources, we cannot maintain this model. And for this reason, the economic growth hand in hand with the sustainable development and the preservation of our environment must be a global concern that the countries uh, must address. Specifically, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio, Antonio Guterres, states that to 
preserve the environment, countries must consider the enormous cost to the environment that the that these economic uh, benefits uh, have. Okay, here we can see a graph which explains the relationship between the uh, growth of the global greenhouse emissions, the material footprint, and also the uh, GDP. So we can see that with the um, with the growth of the global GDP also is growing the material footprint and also the greenhouse emissions in a lower percentage, but is it is also growing. And now, guys, we have the second question on Kahoot. So please let's go to Kahoot to this, this second question. Okay. Mm -mm, here. Okay. So, um, let me know when you're ready, guys, please. To start this second question. Okay, so Didi's ready. Thank you, Andrea, ready. Are you guys ready? Ariana, ready? Okay. Okay, thank you, guys. So uh, let's start this question. Okay, we have eight uh, answers right, so uh, well done, guys. And let's see who is winning. Also, again, Kat and Andrea in the second question and Sophia in the third. So congratulations, guys. Um, let's continue with the uh, training, with the presentation. Give me a second. Okay. Um, now we are going to talk about the urban development that we have to say that currently half of the population lives in urban areas and the trend of rural urban migration, it is expected to continue to increase. Okay, at the beginning of the 20th century, more than 50% of the world's population lived in, city, in cities, and it is estimated that by 2050, this per percentage will exceed the 60%, uh, with most of the growth occurring in uh, Asia and Africa. Okay, so um this population growth in urban area demands many more natural resources and also has a major impact on natural systems this is because the larger the population the greater the need to urbanize forest areas uh, for example it is estimated that more than 30, um, 13 million hectares of forest annually are convected to agriculture, agricultural, urban, and industrial land. Uh, so this forest degradation and deforestation affects all natural system in the way that poses a threat to our biodiversity, because the destruction of the habitats where certain natural species used to live means that now they must adapt to living in cities and this is affecting the composition and the abundance of uh, all these native species. Okay, uh, in addition, the temperatures in cities, the temperature is, in cities is uh, higher than in rural areas 
which is known as the urban, uh, urban heat island effect. And this effect at the alters the pre precipitation patterns, increases ocean, ocean production, specifically uh, during the summer, uh, modifies biochemical processes and causes stress to human and native species. So to mitigate this negative impact of expanding urbanization, uh, we need uh, to design to plan new cities uh, considering the need to coexist with nature because as human beings our survival or our um, uh, existence depends on our availability, uh, ability to coexist with biodiversity and native communities. So this urbanization has brought uh, important benefits for our society, but also um, it has a great impact on the environment. Um, for example, causing a, a worsening the air, the air that we breathe, um, the pollution of the water that we drink, we have less uh, open space, we are most expo exposed to the noise and light pollution and all these uh, kind of things. So, um, as well as having an obvious impact on the environment, all these things it has an impact on people health. So we have to be aware of these issues. Okay, here we can see a photo of the urbanist expansion, expansion in Shanghai, in China. In the left, we see the after in, in the before in uh, 1984. And then in the, in the right, we can see um, uh, the, the, the after. And yeah, it is... Uh, a great photo where you can see this uh, expand urban urbanization. Okay, so now uh, we have here a video where you also can see this uh, urban expansion. Okay. Um, okay, so now we are going to talk about the last impact, uh, which is the technological uh, development uh, that particularly from the 20th century to the present day uh, has been extraordinary. But because it allowed us uh, to use aeroplanes, uh, to use the, the first electronic devices, to use, for example, our mobile phones, our uh, computers. Uh, also, the medicine has improved as never before, thanks to the technology and other things. But also, has uh, also has uh, had impacts on the environment and contribute to climate change throughout the history. Uh, its first major impact began in the 1870s with the second industrial revolution. Uh, during this period, the coal began to be used like the uh, principal resource for generating electricity in in factories, but also in the in the homes, in the houses. Although this um, although this was a great advance for our society because it supplied many areas with energy, 
um, the reality is that there were consequences for the environment and there was there were a large increase in carbon emissions. Um, today we are living in the most technological advanced years and although we are looking for new ways to generate uh, energy to more environmental friendly ways, the reality is that the early technological advances were not environmentally friendly and yeah, the coal was first used in the 1800s and by the 1960s, it has become the main fossil, fossil fuel for uh, power generation in homes and in factories. <clears throat> Sorry. So this great development has had devastating consequence for our environment. Uh, such as the increase in pollution, the high amounts of waste generated, the changes that we make to the environment because of the toxic materials resulting from this production and many things. Um, well, we, the society is looking for new, more environmental ways to generate uh, uh, energy, as I said before, but the reality is that uh, we are still using uh, coal and uh, natural gas to generate uh, electricity. Um, okay, so also the, the, the fact that the technology has advanced so much means that um, more and more people are using multiple devices uh, which means an increase in energy consumption, but also uh, the demand for fossil fuels to um, produce these devices and also to produce the, the energy. For example, I have a mobile phone, but also I have a laptop, I have a car, and I don't know, a lot of uh, electronic devices. Um, yeah, for example, there is so there are also plants, cars, uh, trains, ships that allow us to uh, travel wherever we want, um, and all these things is leading to uh, higher carbon emissions. So um, all the knowledge and these discoveries that uh, mm, the society uh, has we need to put in practice in order to make technological development as environmentally uh, friendly as possible. Okay, uh, here we have a video where they explain how the technology could help, help, uh, help us uh, to face this climate change. So let's see. In my view, we've already waited too long to deal with this climate crisis. We can't wait any longer. Nature is angry. Curbing global warming is a tall order. The world has to move away from fossil fuels, meet rising energy demands, become more energy efficient, and leverage technology. We're going to need a lot of technology in a lot of different forms. And while each of these technologies are not enough to mitigate climate change on their own, understanding how they could help still matters because... We're already seeing some very, very damaging impacts of climate change. So, welcome to another short course by Axios on climate technology. Since the Industrial Revolution, fossil fuels have powered just about everything. From burning things to create electricity, to uh, gasoline and diesel engines, to the emissions from uh, heating and cooling buildings, um, to the food system, moving things around, shipping. That's caused the temperature to jump already. Today, the world is about one degree Celsius warmer than it was before the Industrial Revolution. Plus, a growing global population and industrialization mean there's more demand for energy than ever before. The good news? Demand for technologies to combat climate change is also growing. 
This is going to be a really pivotal year. I mean, look, there is some hope that the kind of economic rescue and stimulus packages that governments will start to implement will provide a boost to some of these low carbon technologies. There are a lot of climate technologies. Climate technologies are different ways that we can lower the emissions from different types of energy, the production of energy, and all sorts of things throughout the daily lives of people and different industries. In general, they fall into three big categories. Number one, technologies we use today. That's current types of solar photovoltaics, wind power, electric cars. These things are all already playing increasing roles in the global energy and transport system, and we just got to deploy them faster. The second category, technologies that exist but aren't widely used. Things that we know how to do at some level, but we're going to need to sort of learn how to do them better and much more cheaply, right? And so, for you know, for example, carbon capture and storage. And then there are technologies in their infancy. So, for example, that would be creating hydrogen in a way that uses renewables. Just about every goal to cut emissions includes climate technologies, but fossil fuels still have a leg up. Energy companies aren't penalized for using them, and... Fossil fuels are incredibly effective. Fossil fuels still account for essentially about 80% of global energy use. That's because they're still cheap, give a lot of bang for their buck, and we have the infrastructure to keep using them. So for alternative technologies to compete... Just a question of a combination of the appropriate incentives, the appropriate political will, the appropriate sort of global focus on this. And it looks like that might be starting to happen. Global attention on this is rising from policymakers, from corporations, from investors, uh, from activists. There's plenty of long-term targets uh, out there already. The question is, are we going to sort of take the steps to achieve those targets? Technology alone won't fix climate change, but understanding how it could help is urgent. I think the bottom line is that there's no sort of single silver bullet technology. It's going to take uh, a lot of different types of advances in technologies and deployment of existing types of climate technologies in order to sort of get on a path toward achieving those goals. Let's review. Climate technology refers to many ways to move away from fossil fuels. We need to deploy more of these technologies and keep researching new ones to avoid rapid climate change. Private investments and stronger policies are bringing attention to climate tech right now. There's still a lot to be done, but certain technologies, like renewables, are growing fast. Okay, I think it's a very interesting video. Okay, and also we have, again, a Kahoot question. So, um, well, well, we are going to the um, Kahoot tab. Give me a second. Okay, so let me know, guys, when you are ready, please. Okay. Are you ready, guys, to start again? Okay, Ariana, Andrea, Alexandro. Okay. Okay, so let's uh, start this uh, third question. Okay, we have eight answers uh, right. Okay, so let's see who is winning now. Again, Kat, so congratulations, Kat. Um, okay, guys, uh, so I think that we um, can do our, the break now. So let's take a break uh, up for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes, okay? so. Let's see you in a few minutes.
Okay, guys, so here we are again. And now we are going to talk about the international agreements and frameworks. As I said at the beginning. So, okay, let's begin this second part of the training. Um, <clears throat> Well, uh, the environmental issues were not addressed in the creation of the U Universal Declaration of Human Rights and neither in the negotiation of the two international covenants on human rights, uh, these covenants that we talked in the, in the first training. So during its first 23 years, uh, action on this issue was limited, limited to operational activities mainly through the uh, World Meteorological Organization. Okay, but when did they start paying attention to it? Uh, they only became concerned about this issue when they realized that the natural resources could be become scarce or limited. So the 1960s, uh, it was a period of growth for the environmental movement and it was mainly focused on preservationist issues. And during this year, the boost of the environmental environmentalism came from civil rights and anti-war uh, movements, particularly from uh, young middle class uh, people. So, uh, as I said, the um, Sorry, the uh, uh, decade of the 60s was a period of growth for the environmental movement, uh, but it was not only uh, until the 1970s that the world became really concerned about this uh, uh, environment issue. Okay, so in the decade of the uh, 70s, uh, the most re important action related to environment was the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment, uh, also known as Stockholm 1972. And we have to uh, remind that it, this conference took place during the Cold War with the two world war powers at odds uh, due to the Vietnam War and various nuclear disarmament agreements uh, between the 1960s and the 1970s. So, but uh, despite this, this conference adopted the, uh, the, the Stockholm Declaration and Action Plan for the Human Environment that represented the first step towards the, uh, the, the establishment of an international environmental law and the recognition of the importance of the uh, environment and nature to our society. Some, uh, so some things included in this document in the action plan for the human environment were uh, first of all, the some basic principles like industrialized uh, countries' commitment to reducing the gap between themselves and the developing countries, the importance of science and technology, the action by the states to prevent pollution of disease and, and the forest, uh, and also um, a more rational management of uh, natural resources. Okay. Uh, in addition, in this conference, uh, also they established the June 5 as the World Environment Day, which this day represents the unity and the fight uh, of the humanity and all states who face this climate change. But uh, the most important uh, outcome of this conference was the creation of, of the European Union Environment Program, program also known as uh, UNEP, which is a body that assists governments into developing environmental policies by providing with uh, technical services 
advice and also carrying out concrete for programs for those countries that uh, request them. And following this uh, Stockholm conference, the UNEP took the lead in the, in the development of numerous international environmental uh, treaties. Okay. But here in Europe, we also became concerned about these uh, issues in this decade. So since 1973, the, the European Commission has been publishing environmental action plans, which set out the legislative proposals and objectives of the uh, European Union environmental policy. Okay, so let's change to the decade of the 1980s. Um, the, in this decade, the uh, environmental movement experienced its second wave uh, based on anti-war feelings and, uh, and peace activism. So also we have to understood, uh, understand that, this, uh, that in this decade, the Chernobyl accident occurred, which caused a huge Suck to the society, but also to the environment, specifically here in Europe. And it can be said that the most important action related to environment of this decade was the World Commission on Environment and Development in 1987, uh, with the publication of the famous Brundtland Report where uh, they established uh, for the first time the definition of sustainable development uh, and they uh, understood that the current development could not compromise the capability of future generations to uh, fulfill its needs. But this uh, concept has its own limitation because each generation uh, has uh, different technology and also the environmental resources that um, we use is different as well. But uh, in this report, they state that uh, the critical global problems were mainly the result of the poverty of the global south due to the unsustainability habits of consumption of the north of the uh, world. Moreover, the United Nations in this decade uh, created the Human Development Index, which is a, a, sta a, sorry, a statistical tool uh, to measure countries' economy and social achievement, but also uh, uh, con and, um, taking into consideration the ecological footprint per capita, the education, or the satisfaction of minimum health standards. So here um, we can see um, the ranking of human development. But first, I want to ask you guys, which uh, country do you think it is the one with the biggest human development nowadays? So what do you think, guys? Which is the country with the uh, highest human development? I know it's difficult to participate. Okay, USA, Germany, okay. Maybe another here in Europe or I don't know. What do you think guys? Okay, Finland, yeah. So I'm going to share uh, my other screen. Okay, so in the first position, we have Switzerland. Uh, and in the second, we have uh, Norway. In the third, Iceland. And let's see in which position it is uh, Greece in the 33. And Spain, it is in the uh, 27th position. 
And I don't know, let's see more. Ireland in the eighth position, Finland in the 11th, Germany. Uh, okay, so guys, you go see, you can see this, uh, this uh, ranking before, uh, after when I uh, share with you the, the presentation. Okay, so let's continue with my presentation. Give me a second. Okay. Okay, one second, please. Okay, I'm ready. Well, here we can see also a video where they explain in a very easy way uh, what what it, what it is the sustainable development. So. Hi guys. Do you have time for a few quick questions? I see you're having a lot of fun, but do you ever stop and think if what you do is sustainable? And do you know what sustainable development means? Sustainable development is to make the world a better place for everyone now without destroying the possibilities for the next generations. If you wonder if something is sustainable, you can ask yourself, can we do this over and over again forever? Sustainable development means that we need to keep three things in mind at once social progress, economic development, and climate and environment. First of all, we have to take care of our planet. We have many natural ecosystems that must be in balance in order for us to live here. The climate system is one of them. This system ensures that the temperature is correct and that the atmosphere emits exactly the right amount of solar energy. When we emit harmful greenhouse gases, such as CO2, we clog the atmosphere. This changes the temperatures in Earth, which again affects our development. How we produce and use energy is incredibly important. Oil and coal are examples of energy we may run out of. Water, wind and sun, however, will always be here. Using the lasting sources of energy that renew themselves is good for the planet and can provide jobs for years to come. Economics Almost everything we develop, buy and trade starts with nature. The smarter we use our natural resources and the better systems we create for a fair distribution, the more sustainable we are. One way to contribute to a more uneven distribution is to be more aware of what we buy and how it is produced. A football is a good example. It travels far before it reaches the football players. First, the materials are made. Then, they print the logo somewhere else before a third country sews it all together. One single football sees the whole world before it reaches its goal. This journey ties us together. If we are to win the battle for a sustainable future, we have to play with fair rules that applies to everyone. Social progress. We humans are part of nature, but we're also important resources for the world. Just like water, the forest, and the sun, we have minds that can create the strangest and most creative things. But for us to be the best versions of ourselves, there are certain things that must be in order, like having equal opportunities to education, safety, food, and medicine. This provides greater opportunities for us as human beings, but also for the planet. We just have to think in new ways. These three must work together. That is sustainable development. And there is actually a plan for this. All the countries of the United Nations have agreed on a joint plan for sustainable development. But for the plan to work, we need to cooperate and we need you to be on board. Are you with us? Okay. Um, okay, so um, 
at, uh, in, in this decade, in the 1980s, uh, within the European Union, um, this uh, single European Act of 1987 uh, was uh, approved and introduced a new environment title, which provide the first legal basis for um, a common environmental policy with the aims of uh, preserving the quality of the environment, protecting, protecting human health, um, and using uh, natural resources in a, a sustainable way. Also, this environmental uh, title introduced uh, uh, an important thing, which is the subs subsidiar subsidiar subsidiarity principle, um, which understood the, that the measures uh, at a European level are more effective than those uh, at, an, at an individual level. So this change of mindset involved into a re regionalization of the tools and policies to uh, face the climate, to tackle the climate. Okay. <clears throat> there are more uh, international treaties that was approved in this uh, uh, that were approved in this uh, decade, and you can see uh, later. Okay, so let's change to the decade of the 1990s. Um, in this decade, the most important relevant action uh, regarding the environment was uh, the um, United Nations Conference on Environment and Development that took place in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. It is also known as the Earth Summit. You can see, you may see, you may uh, know this uh, conference uh, with this name, the Earth Summit. And this marked the beginning of the legal recognition of the connection or the relationship between the human rights and the environment. Also, it highlighted how the socioeconomic activities and the environment are uh, interdependent, interdependent uh, and a success in one sector requires action in other sectors to be uh, sustained. So uh, in this uh, conference, uh, this conference produced uh, some uh, achievements as a result. The first one, it is the uh, Rio Declaration with 27 universal prin principles, which put human beings in the center of the uh, sustainable development and highlights the importance of the right to a healthy and a productive life in harmony with uh, nature. Also, uh, these principles are focused in all states and peoples uh, cooperating, including the vital role of women, indigenous people, and also the youth. The youth. Uh, another achievement uh, was the Agenda 21, which is a program of action to call in into uh, invest in the future to achieve the sustainable development in the fair in the fields like education um, uh, preservation our natural resources our sustainable sustainable economy but the most important outcome of this conference was the the creation of the united nations framework convention on climate change signed by uh, 154 states with the aim to with the aim of preventing dangerous human interference with climate change this system uh, this uh, adoption led to signing the uh, 1997 kyoto protocol and also in this uh, decade uh, in 1994, it was created the Conference of the Parties, this famous uh, COP. And here we have a video where um, where they explain the what what the what means this Conference of the Party. What what it is. 
What is COP? Hi, I'm Dr. Nicole Nisbet. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow in climate politics at the University of Leeds. Since 1995, governments around the world have met every year to discuss how they can respond to global climate change. There are 197 countries and nations that are all represented at the Conference of Parties, or COP, and this is responsible for reviewing and trying to understand what progress is being made to limit global climate change. The COP happens every year, it's in a different city every year, and this year it's being hosted by Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt. This year is the 27th meeting, hence COP27. There's two zones in COP. You have the blue zone, where the formal negotiations and discussions take place. And there's also an area for side events and exhibitions that many businesses and charities, universities and other organisations can attend. Although the Blue Zone is closed to the public, there's an area called the Green Zone, which is open to everybody to attend. You can find out how the University of Leeds is participating at COP27 through the Priestley Centre website. What's your question? Okay. Sorry. Um, also, in this decade, at a European level, uh, there were um, in Europe approved uh, some important territories to tackle the, cl the climate. The first one, uh, most important, it is the Treaty of Maastricht of um, 1993 and, and made the environment an official European Union policy area. And then we have the Treaty of, Ast of Amster Amsterdam of 1999 that established the duty to integrate environmental protection into all European Union sectoral policies with a view to promoting their sustainable development. Okay, so uh, guys, we have the question four in Kahoot again. So um, let me change my screen again to this uh, new tab. Sorry, uh, okay, here. So let me know when you are all ready, please, to start this uh, question. Okay, thank you, Petros. Thank you, Sotiris. Okay, vamos, <laughs> Alexandro. Okay, so let's start. Okay, so we have three uh, answers correct. This was dif a difficult one. So let's see who's winning now. Okay, again, Kat, uh, second, Sophie, Sophia, and at the third, in the third, Andrea. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Um, let's continue with uh, the training. Okay, so now we are going to talk about the two, uh, 2000s. Um, in this decade, the most relevant action was the World Summit on Sustainable Development that took place in Johannesburg in, uh, in 2002, where the government and non-governments -government organization uh, meet, met and adopt a political declaration and implementation plan aiming to proceed forward in the development with with con contact contact with a uh, respect for the environment and um, to um, make changes in or to to uh, make decisions uh, related to the water the energy the health the agriculture 
and other areas of uh, concern. So one of the results of this summit was the Johannesburg Declaration, uh, which is an international agreement on the environment and sustainable development that set out the ob objectives for carving poverty uh, worldwide. But while saving the environment, reduction pollution, and providing energy to all the people. Okay, um, at the European level, the most important action, um, most important, rele uh, uh, most relevant action was the uh, European Union Sustainable Development of uh, 2001 which aimed to improve the quality of life standards of present and future generation, generations by creating sustainable communities worldwide capable of managing and using resor resources efficient, efficiently. This strategy aims to uh, wanted to unite uh, the business policy makers, but also the social policy makers and the environmental policy makers into a team that will work together hand in hand towards the betterment of their respective fields. The, this strategy follows uh, seven key priority challenges they perceive they need to, to improve. Uh, the first one is the climate change, then the clean energy, the sustainable transport, the sustain, sustainable consumption and production, and the conservation and management of natural resources. Okay. Mm. So in the decade of the uh, 2010s, um, 2010s um, the, the most important action was the Conference on Sustainable Development that took place in, in 2012 on Rio de Janeiro, again, in, in Brazil. And it is also known as a Rio Plus 20 Conference. The main issues discussed were uh, how to develop and implement a green economy, how to reduce the global, the global poverty, and how to advance uh, in the international coordination for sustainable development. The outcome of this conference was the, elabor the elaboration of a document called The Future We Want, which contains a clear and practical measures for the implementation of sustainable development. And in this decade, mem members decide to uh, start a process to elabor uh, elaborate the well-known sustainable development goals that now we are going to uh, talk about. So Rio Plus 20 was the impulse uh, needed to take action on poverty and environmental destruction and to build a bridge be, uh, to a sustainable uh, future, as, yeah, to the sustainable development. Okay, uh, so in September uh, 2015, the United Nations Sustainable Development Summit took place in uh, New York. And the outcome of this summit was the transformative uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And this document uh, include the uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goals and the uh, 169 targets. Um, okay, so uh, here we have a video where they explain uh, which, uh, which is these, which, uh, which are the sustainable development goals. Did you know that the UN Sustainable Development Goals are a universal call to action that unites 193 countries around the world? If these global goals are fulfilled by 2030, life on Earth will be better for everyone. So what are these goals? Eliminate poverty in all its forms. No hunger. Everyone should have safe, nutritious, and sufficient food. 
Everyone has equal access to health care, thus ensuring our well-being and a healthy life. Equal access to a quality education. Ensure gender equality where women and girls have the same opportunities as men and boys. By achieving these goals, each member of our society will be equal, safe, and happy. UN Global Goals also include Access to safe drinking water and sanitation Access to clean energy that is safe for people and the environment Sustainable and stable economic growth Everyone has a decent job Strong infrastructure and the support of innovations Lower inequality within and among countries Cities and settlements be developed without damaging the environment and people Achieving these goals will result in the well-being of people and our planet. We can further take care of our environment with the following goals. Sustainable and safe production and consumption of products. Take urgent measures to reduce climate change and its impact. Ensure the sustainable use and protection of ocean and sea resources. Restore and protect Earth's ecosystems. By achieving these goals, we will form a society where strong institutions ensure peace and justice. It is important for everyone to be involved and to build partnerships for achieving sustainable development goals. You are part of this process. Demand the implementation of these goals. Take the lead and share information with your friends. Okay. Okay, um, also in the same year, in 2018, took place the Paris COP21 uh, that resulted in the uh, Paris Agreement, this famous uh, agreement, which is a legally binding inter international theatre on climate change, which was later adopted by uh, 190 parties. And its aim is to limit uh, global warming to well below uh, two uh, degrees Celsius, preferably to uh, 1.5 degrees compared to the pre-industrial levels. So achieving this ambition target requires states to halve their annual greenhouse gases emissions by 2030. And and also the three key elements of these uh, Paris agreements are the first one, as I said, limit the temperature to 1.5 degrees. Uh, the second one, where we win countries' commitments every five years. And the third one, it is uh, providing fin finance to countries uh, to mitigate these climate change. Uh, but the truth is that the targets set out in this uh, Paris Agreement are still insufficient to achieve that temperature, which, which is why the United Nations points out that the current um, ambitions need to be five times higher. Okay, I've, I've here a video um, explaining this uh, Paris Agreement. What is the Paris Agreement? Oh, sorry. Ah. <laughs> One second. Okay. What is the Paris Agreement? The Paris Agreement is a legally binding international treaty on climate change to limit global warming to well below 2, preferably to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. This requires economic and social transformation to face the climate challenges now and moving into the future based on the best available science. The Paris Agreement works on a five-year cycle of increasingly ambitious climate action. By 2020, countries communicate their plans known as nationally determined contributions. Countries communicate actions they will take to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions in order to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement. Countries also communicate actions they will take to build resilience to adapt to the impacts of rising temperatures. This may include information on adaptation and finance flows. The Paris Agreement also provides a framework for financial, technical, and capacity building support to those countries who need it. 
Starting in 2024, countries report transparently on actions taken. Collective progress under the Paris Agreement will be assessed through a global stock take. This will lead to recommendations for countries to set more ambitious plans in the next round. Okay. So now the last uh, decade, it is the uh, 2020s. And in this decade, the most important action was the climate action uh, summit took place in uh, New York. That this summit succeed in, in the idea that the 1.5 degrees, it is the social, economic and safe limit for our planet. And for that, this requires um, achieving the global zero emissions by 2050 and a complete transformation of uh, economies uh, to, to meet these sustainable development goals. Uh, in this uh, summit, it was also shown that the states are currently far from meeting the global targets because emissions continue to grow and as a consequence, uh, the temperatures continue to rise. So as a result, our parties were uh, aware of the need to increase uh, the climate change mitigation and adaptation. Okay, and at the European level, uh, the most important action it is the uh, European Green Deal that was presented by the European Commission. Uh, and the aim of this pact it is to achieve climate neutrality by, uh, by 2050, as I said before, in the European Union and meet the Paris Agreement. So the, the, this pact this pact consists uh, in a package of uh, policy of policy and legislative initiatives called uh, Fit for uh, Fit for Fifty Five. Uh, uh, I met at achieving a green transition and uh, climate neutrality. These initiatives cover uh, climate, uh, environment, energy, transportation, industries, and uh, agriculture and sustainable finance. This pact also responds uh, to a need and concern of the people of Europe uh, because the European Union citizens um, consider the climate change like a serious problem and they important and they are very aware of these uh, environmental issues so anyone who wants to participate and to be a part of this green deal uh, can can do it for example um, you could become an ambassador of this pact or maybe a friend of this pact so um, in the material in this presentation that I'm going to upload to the Google Classroom, you can find a link where they explain how to do these things. If you uh, click to this uh, icon, you can see the 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 this the link. Okay, here we have we have a video explaining this Green Deal uh, proposal. The European Green Deal is Europe's new growth strategy. We have to act now. The European Commission has prepared three concrete actions that will offer a strong basis for the New Deal. I want Europe to become the first climate neutral continent in the world by 2050. Real benefits include zero pollution, affordable and secure energy, smarter transport and high quality food. A just transition fund will leverage public and private money, including uh, with the help of the European Investment Bank. All these will contribute to a global green deal 
no one will be left behind. We will deliver a sustainable Europe investment plan. Our one trillion euro of investment would give investors confidence to make long-term decisions on environmentally responsible projects. This will mean new jobs, a cleaner environment, and a better quality of life for people. We Europeans are ready. Okay. Um, so guys, the last thing I'm going to explain to you in this training, um, it is the uh, this new human right to a healthy environment. So um, on July, on the uh, 27th July, 2022, the United Nations General Assembly de declared that everyone on the planet has a right to a healthy environment. And, um, and the states have to guarantee uh, these, these rights to, to their populations. Uh, well, the, the access to this right to a clean, healthy, and a sustainable uh, environment. And although this resolution was adopted in 2022, uh, it was first mentioned in the uh, 1972 Stockholm Declaration. Um, and for an for the uh, international protection of this uh, uh, right, uh, the reality is that is not it is not a legally binding document. Uh, but however, um, it could help to countries to uh, to recognize this uh, this right to a healthy environment in his na national constitutions. And, and also the truth is that this right appears in the constitution of more than 100 states and a total of more or less 130 countries already legally recognize this right to a healthy and a sustainable environment. Uh, Portugal was the first country to include it in its constitution. And since then it has been extended to other territories. Okay, so uh, we have the last question, guys, in Kahoot. So um, let's do it. And we are going to know who is the winner. Uh, okay. So let me know when you are ready, please, guys. It is the last question, so. Okay, ready, ready. Let's wait for a few seconds more. Let's go. Vamos, vamos. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's start the last question of the training. Um, okay. It is true of or false, okay? Okay, we have five answers right. So now we are going to know who is the winner, the final winner. Okay, in the third position is uh, Petra, in the second, Andrea, and in the one, in the first, Katia. Okay, so congratulations guys to all of you for being here, for participating in this uh, easy Petra. Yeah, it was easy, yes. <laughs> so, um, uh, congratulations to all of you. And well, guys, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, in the next uh, week, we, we will see you again, also in Thursday. 
<laughs> Alexandro, hola. So thank you so much, guys, and see you the next week. I'm going to upload uh, the uh, recording session, also the presentation, the, the presentation and also all the links to the video or in, uh, also another um, links or videos that could be useful to you. So thank you so much, guys. Um, uh, yeah, thank you so much for being here. So uh, bye and have a nice weekend and all these kind of things. So bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Adios. <laughs> thank you. It was very interesting. Thank you so much, Dora. Muchas gracias, profesora. Gracias, Alexandros. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you guys. See you.